We are very pleased to welcome you all uh, to this uh, first policy lecture in 2008-18 in our trade dialogue series. Um, our speaker today is Professor uh, Paola Conconi uh, from the, the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Paola, who is currently visiting professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science, is also director of the CEPR Research Network on Global Value Chains, Trade and Development. Her main research interests are in international trade, firm organization, and political economy. And she holds a PhD in economics from the University of Warwick and has published in several leading journals, including the AER, uh, the American Econ Economic Review, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of Political Economy, and the Journal of International Economics. Uh, Paula will present unique and novel findings on the effects of uh, rules of origin on trade patterns. Uh, rules of origin are a common ingredient uh, of regional trade agreements, but their effects on trade patterns are not very well understood. Paola will show the, how rules of origin affect uh, imports of intermediate goods from third countries and discuss uh, the potential implications of her findings with respect to the WTO agreements. I wish to uh, warmly uh, thank Paola for having accepted our invitation to give this lecture today on her way to the Villar uh, Trade Seminar, where sun and snow are waiting for her. Uh, Paula will speak for about 45 minutes, uh, after which our colleague Mar Maria Donner has accepted to give a few comments on the findings that Paula will present. And after Maria's uh, intervention, we will have uh, a questions and answers session uh, where you will have opportunities to ask questions and, uh, and, and, clap and, and see if, you, if there is anything to clarify clarification points. Paula, the yeah. floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think it's on. So thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I guess I'll try to make it, you know, this is a more policy audience. I see some economists. I'm sure some of you are lawyers. Uh, so I'll make it not too technical. And I'll try. Let me start from the broad motivation of this project. And the broad motivation behind this, this, this project which, with whom I've worked with two colleagues who are economists and one lawyer, and you'll see in a few slides why we needed a lawyer on board, is, uh, you know, is the two recent trends. If you think about the last few decades, there have been two important trends in international trade. One is, of course, the emergence of GVCs, of global value chains. And here, you, as I'm sure you're all aware, as of the early 90s, as a result of, on one hand, changes in communication costs uh, and also transport costs and trade barriers. What has happened is that increasingly, the various process, stages of production process, they used to be carried out in close proximity, often by, you know, either by the same firms or firms nearby, are now fragmented across countries and across firms. And this is a big, uh, you know, if you think about most manufacturing goods, from your iPhone to your computers to cars, right, you know, there's, they are usually, um, uh, the process that has led to the final good is, you know, there have been inputs uh, produced by suppliers around the world. And so this is the first trend that has led uh, to a big increase in the share of trade that is accounted by intermediates goods trade. In fact, uh, according to a highly cited JA paper, it's now two-thirds of international trade is trade in intermediates. And so that's a big trend, this global fragmentation of production processes. And there is a second trend that is also uh, characterized recent decades, and that's the proliferation of regional trade agreements. You know, uh, I mean, here, I don't need to show this picture, but I'm going to show it, but it's basically produced here. So every year you see this increase in the number of agreements being negotiated and enforced. And, these, and most of these agreements uh, that have been starting to explode as of the early 90s also are free trade agreements, like almost 90% are uh, free trade agreements. So if you look at global value chains, in fact, they are, most of the intermediate goods trade is actually not global, but regional. Uh, as Richard Baldwin uh, has put it, you know, it's about factory North America, factory Asia, factory uh, Europe. So what, uh, what we are trying to do in this project is to see to what extent these two trends are related, and in particular trying to see to what extent free trade agreements can distort uh, sourcing decision and intermediate goods trade. So there are two channels to which free trade agreements can distort sourcing 
an intermediate goods trade. The, the first channel is very transparent and has been studied a lot, and that's tariff, preferential tariffs. Of course, if you think about a final good producer who can source, say you're a car producer and you want to source an engine, if you source the engine from a, you know, a supplier in the free trade area, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get no tariffs. If you source it from outside the free trade area, you're going to face an input tariff. So the tariffs is, preferential tariffs are a first reason for trade diversion, but there's a more covered uh, channel through which uh, free trade agreement can distort uh, trade in intermediates, and that these are rules of origin, which are much less studied, and, and, and our project was basically to try to, to look at to what extent rules of origin, uh, as well as tariffs, uh, can distort uh, global value chains and sourcing decision and give rise to uh, trade diversion in intermediate goods, basically showing how uh, non-members can really suffer from uh, rules of origin in preferential trade agreements. So what are these rules of origin? I'm sure in this, to this audience I don't need to explain, but basically uh, they're a key feature of free trade agreements, preferential rules of origin, in the sense that they're, so they are meant to avoid trade deflection. You know, if you want to, you know, they need, they are there to define under what condition is a good eligible, eligible for preferential tariff treatment. And, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to define what's the origin of an iPhone or, or, or a lot of these goods in an era of global value chains, because usually, as we said before, there are lots of, uh, inputs or intermediate inputs that are part of this production process. But, you know, there are two rules that are uh, used to define the origin of goods. Uh, either value-added rules, like a, a certain, at least a certain percentage of the value of a good needs to be domestic, you know, with the, produced within the FTA, or change of tariff classification, which uh, are basically much more, allow you to pinpoint really the restricted intermediates. And I'm going to give you examples uh, of both rules. But uh, so if, you f if you're thinking about a final good producer who's thinking about, uh, you know, whether or not to comply to rules of origin, say you're a car producer uh, and you have to decide whether or not to comply to the sourcing restriction implied by rules of origin, you face, uh, you know, a trade-off. On one hand, if you comply, you get origin on your final good, and that allows you to get preferential tariff treatment when exporting to your FTA trading partners rather than an MFN. So that's the gain. But of course, you may have to distort your sourcing decision. You may have to you know, source certain inputs from FTA suppliers rather than uh, from suppliers outside the FTA. Uh, you can decide instead not to comply, in which case you are free to source your inputs from wherever, you know, from the most efficient suppliers around the world, but then when exporting your final good to the FTA partners, you will face MFN rather than preferential tariff rates. So the trade-off is very clear, and, and it's well known uh, for decades. In fact, Gene Grossman's job market paper in QJE81 was about the fact that these uh, sourcing restriction would, can give rise to trade diversion in intermediates. What is also known, if you look at surveys, uh, firm-level surveys, is that firms say that uh, rules of origin are the biggest non-tariff barriers they face, at least firms in manufacturing. So theoretically, that's been known for a long time. Policymakers and firms say this is a big concern, but empirically, you, we knew very little of, to, of these, the extent to which rules of origin give rise to trade diversion. And so the main goal of this paper, uh, which is with joint work with uh, Manuel Garcia Santana, the uh, UPF in Barcelona, Laura Puccio, who is the lawyer on the team, who was a student of Petros uh, Mavroidis, and, uh, and Roberto Venturini, who used to be one of my graduate students at Brussels, was to, to actually systematically examine uh, the impact of rules of origin uh, in free trade agreements on uh, trading intermediates. So there are two challenges that you face when you want to address this question. The first is measurement, and that's been a major limitation uh, in the literature because these rules are complex. And I'll give you, again, examples in a second. That's why you need a lawyer on board. These rules, you know, if you want to understand the rules of origin or the NAFTA, Agreement, you have to codify, you know, hundreds of pages of Annex 401. You know, it's, it's, there's a part of it that you just, economists couldn't do it by themselves, as you'll see. They're, they're usually very complex, but one of the reasons why 
So the way we dealt with this first challenge is to focus on NAFTA for two reasons. One is NAFTA is the biggest free trade agreement in the world. But more interestingly, to deal with this measurement issue, NAFTA is a good case because NAFTA relies very little on value-added rules, or at least there's never value-added rules by themselves. There are a lot of rules that are, you know, most rules are tariff classification shift rules, and sometimes you have on top of it uh, value-added rules, as I'll explain. But this makes it very easy to pinpoint what are the restricted intermediates. Let me give you straight away one example, and you'll have another one uh, in a few slides. So in the case of watches, so if you look at Annex 401, you'll have that if you have the final good that you're thinking of is watches, there's a certain HS6 code that's going to be 9102. And the rules of origin on watches basically imply that in order for the watch to be considered as originating from NAFTA, you need that uh, these inputs, watch movements, watch straps, and watch cases, are produced within NAFTA, are sourced within NAFTA. It's supposedly a producer within NAFTA sources the watch movement from Switzerland, then you wouldn't get origin. And then when exporting the, or the watch, the final good to the other FTA partners, you will not have preferential tariffs, usually zero, but you'll face MFN. So this is very detailed product level, which is not always the case for other FTAs. And, and this allows us, as you'll see, to construct a new data set that allows us to trace for every final good what are the restricted intermediate goods. And for every intermediate goods, we can look and trace back what are the final goods that impose sourcing restrictions on them. So that's on measurement. There is a second challenge that you face as, you know, as a researcher, which is identifying the causal effect of rules of origin on trading intermediates. And, and uh, these I could spend lots of hours, but it becomes very nerdy very quickly. But basically, we deal with this endogeneity concern in many ways. The first is we focus on Mexico, the effect of NAFTA rules of origin on Mexican imports. I understand there is a Mexican there, so I'm going to look at you. So Mexico, of course, was the late comer. You know, NAFTA was, uh, came after the Canada-US free trade agreement. And a lot of the rules of origin, actually over 90% of the rules contained in the NAFTA agreement were inherited from the Canada-US free trade agreement. So Mexico, in a way, inherited rules that were negotiated before between the US and Canada. Uh, also, so not only do we uh, focus on Mexico, but the most important thing is we use this methodology, which I'll go and explain, trying to be not too technical, but triple difference methodology, which allows you to deal with uh, 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 endogeneity concerns. So the fact that there could be, if you see a positive correlation between, say, the presence of rules of origin in a sector and a fall in imports from third countries in another sector, you may be concerned that this is driven by some other omitted variable, some other sectoral trends that be could be correlated with both. This triple difference methodology allows you to deal with this kind of concerns. And finally, we also do, in one of the many robustness checks, we have used, we have codified also the Canada-US free trade agreement the rules, and we have used those uh, from the previous agreement as an instrument. What do we find? So for those, uh, what are the, you know, in a nutshell, the main finding, as, uh, uh, you know, the theory had already suggested for decades, and as we expected, you know, there is uh, a big, there is a significant and sizable effect of rules of origin on trade in intermediate goods. In particular, what you see is that uh, rules of origin really uh, deterred or led to a decline in Mexican imports of intermediate goods from third countries. So if you're thinking of an, uh, the example of a car producer, if you are, say, located in Mexico and you're thinking about whether to import the engine from, say, Germany, even though you may have a zero tariff on the input, so the, the engine may come at zero tariff, but the key thing is that you, if, you, if you need the engine to get the origin on the car, you may stop importing the engine from Germany simply because then if you, if you source this input from outside NAFTA, you lose the origin on the, origin on the final good, the car. And that's obviously something that is, will mean facing a much higher tariff when exporting to your FTA partners. So we find evidence of this trade diversion, which is what you would expect. We also find evidence that the extent of the trade diversion depends, as again you would expect, on the extent to which final good producers have incentive to comply with these rules. So for example, on the extent of the preference margin, the more is the, the bigger is the difference between the MFN 
and the preferential tariff rate of your FTA partners, the more you want to comply, the more you have to gain by getting origin. And also it matters, this is where you see that the dev is in the, in the, is in the details, that it matters a lot how the rules are written. So if they're rigid or flexible, and I'll explain what I mean by that. On average, the rules of the introduction of rules of origin uh, led to, you know, a sizable decrease in trading intermediates from third countries. You know, the counterfactual, you know, our estimates indicate that had there not been rules of origin, uh, the imports of these in treated intermediate goods would have been 45% higher, which is really, and it's very robust across specifications. So it's compared to imports from, uh, non, uh, from NAFTA partners. So it's not only a significant but sizable effect, as you'll see. So in a way, also, what is, what is interesting is that there, there have been previous recent papers, like Caliendo and Paro on the Review of Economic Studies, but also a JPE paper that I'll mention in a second, that have basically uh, reassessed the, the trade and welfare implications of the North America Free Trade Agreement and have reached very rosy conclusion. Oh, NAFTA led to no trade diversion. Of course, this agreement had abstracted from rules of origin. They were only looking at what was easily measurable, which were tariffs. But what our analysis allows you to see is that like, once you take into account the cover kind of protection that is embedded in rules of origin, you see that actually the, the, the picture changes dramatically and that you know, it's not, no longer the case that the rest of the world was not affected by NAFTA. So this is a little bit, by the way, I don't know whether you can see much from the back, maybe, okay? So otherwise we could switch off a bit one of the lights. But anyway, here is a, a bit of the literature. So I was mentioning, this is the, the recent paper on uh, Ristad and, uh, J, and JP, which have this very rosy conclusion that we are sort of overturning. There is an established theoretical literature that models, if you want, the key trade-off I was outlining before. There is also a literature that has tried to somewhat measure rules of origin, but the previous work was based on synthetic indexes. They basically would say, okay, how restrictive are rules of origin in this agreement in this sector from, say, one to seven? But you couldn't really keep track of input output linkages. So you cannot really look at the question of how rules of origin give rise to trade diversion because you, would, you don't have this possibility to say, okay, these are the restricted intermediaries, which is what, you know, that's our main contribution to really map input output linkages in rules of origin. So be able to, to look at this, you know, how rules of origin on final goods are implicit tariff on intermediate goods. So I'm going to, I think, assume all of you know about NAFTA, but basically, this just let me point out, as I was mentioned, that NAFTA it didn't come out of the blue. NAFTA came, uh, you know, the negotiations of NAFTA, uh, you know, was apparently Mexico approached the U.S. in the early 90s after the U.S. had already signed the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement, and then the negotiations were enlarged to Canada. So, you know, in 1990. Uh, three, the NAFTA agreement was signed in 94, it entered into force, and it took more or less 10 years for most tariffs to be reduced. A lot of the tariffs were, uh, were removed uh, immediately and others were phased out uh, within 10 years. All rules of origin became uh, effective from day one. Uh, okay, so let me spend uh, a few minutes on the construction of the data set, because that's really, I think, actually methodologically also something that could be done, and in fact, the OECD has started to do, to try to use our methodology to code rules of origin on other free trade agreements. So the step were four. The first is really the law, which in, case, in the case of NAFTA is Annex 401, which is where all the uh, rules of origin of the NAFTA agreement are contained. And for that step, you really need a lawyer. Let me explain you why. This is the text of an example of a paragraph that if you are not a lawyer or an actually a lawyer expert in rules of origin, you would not uh, understand. At least I wouldn't. At least I had Laura explaining it to me. So this would, is a rules of origin on men's and boys' trousers, which is HS code 6203.42. So this is an example of a final good. And, and what are the rules for this good to be considered as originating in NAFTA? So the rules read, so there are two parts. Let me already translate to it. The first part is the so-called main rule, which basically is uh, from change to subheading 60 or through da, 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 from any other chapter. So this basically means that any final good that is in between this range of uh, HX6 goods 
needs you know, all the inputs. If there is any inputs from the same chapter, meaning chapter 62, these inputs need to be sourced within NAFTA in order for these final products to be considered as originated. So this already, this first main rule, restricts all the sourcing of all the inputs within chapter 62. On top of it, the rest of the paragraph is about additional sourcing restriction on top of the, these are the additional requirement, which, and basically that's from except of heading. So on top of all chapter 62, there are these additional codes that uh, basically would identify other inputs that must be sourced within the FDA in order for the final good, the pens. So for example, you know, yarn and, fo and fabric of wool, uh, these would be part of the additional requirement there that needs to be sourced within after. If you basically, there are cases that we mentioned in the paper where there were Mexican producers who sourced these inputs, a cotton yarn, a piece of fabric from the Philippines, and not knowing that this was, and it's enough. If, if it, not, it doesn't matter, you know, what the value of this piece it could be a little transformation, a little piece in the, you know, maybe a very small value added. But uh, as, you know, if this is one of the in one of the list of the restricted intermediaries, you lose origin, as it was the case of this final good producer. So, so in some cases, which is not the case in textile, but in some sectors, you have additional or complementary value read the rule. So on top of this, there's always a rule like this, which a tariff classification shift rule. But sometimes on top of it, you'll have rules that say you need also to have a, you know, to, to comply with a value added uh, requirement or you have an alternative value added rule. So you can comply either with this kind of rule or with a value added rule. So we'll, we'll also codify that. So step one was just the law. Step two was actually coding it first in an Excel format. So this is going back to the example. So what you have here is like the first column is basically the range of output from 6 to 341 to 6 to 349, which includes the men's boys and trousers. Then we kept track of what is the main rule. This is at the chapter two digit level. That was chapter 62. Whether or not there are value added rules, alternative or complementary, in this case there's none. What are the additional input requirement, et cetera. From these, which is still where the lawyer was codifying, you have to then get the economy takeover by basically saying, you know, using, constructing a data set that uses all this information. So this is basically the pens. You see this code reappearing 6203-42. All this code, this is all the, the, the code, the six digit code that identifies men's boys and trousers. And these are all the restricted inputs based on the main rule and additional requirement. And this is, you can look at the matrix this way, or you can turn it around and basically look. This was one of the restrictive intermediaries. You can look at the same restrictive intermediaries and you'll have a lot of final goods, including the first, which is the men's boys and trousers, but others, other final goods, they impose sourcing restriction on the same intermediate goods. So basically, in the end, you have, you can create dummies, ROIJ, which are going to be equal to one, identify uh, cases in which a final good I, say the men's boys and trousers, imposes restriction on an intermediate J, say cotton yarn. So this is a, a visual uh, illustration of the data set at a very aggregate level. So in fact, this gives you, uh, the, so here you have inputs, all the inputs and all the outputs at a very aggregate level. But each of these blue dots contains, in fact, thousands of rules. So in fact, you can zoom in on, on a subset, and each of these dots become thousands of dots. Basically, uh, I'm almost getting to the rule. So now. <laughs> So I think this is now, at this level, you have one dot is a rule of origin linking a final good, say pens, to an intermediate, say cotton yarn, at the HS6 level. So this is the way the data is organized. Uh, no, that was the last dot. So this is the last. OK, so what do we do with this data set? We construct different treatment variables, which are basically trying to capture to what extent a particular intermediate goods was, in, was subject to sourcing restrictions. So the first. So we, the intermediate good is going to be called J, and we're going to have different ROOJ variable treatment of this good J. So the first is going to be a simple count of how many rules of origin restrict the sourcing of this final good. So you're looking at all the ROIJ, all the final good that impose restriction on this particular intermediate J, and you just simply count them up. The second is going to be looking at uh, removing 
those rules are irrelevant. relevant. What are irrelevant rules? Well, irrelevant rules are those for which the preference margin is zero. So there are many actually final goods for which there is no difference between the preferential and MFN tariff rate. So these are cases in which there is a rule on a final good I that imposes a restriction on a J, but if you're a producer of good I, there's nothing to gain by complying with the rules. So this should be a relevant rule. So the second treatment takes all the rules and removes those that have zero preference margin, they co the producers should have no incentive to comply. And the last treatment, which is our preferred treatment, is the basically focus on rules that are both relevant, meaning there's something to gain by complying with them, the preference margin is positive, and strict in the sense that there's no value-added alternative rule that you can use to get origin. And also, a big part of the paper is to try to figure out, and that's where you know, you get into the nitty gritty of things. So a lot of these rules are written, say if you have a chapter rule, this will, will say, okay, if you want to produce a certain final good, this is all the chapter that identifies the restricted intermediates. But sometimes these are not actually input in the production of the final good. Let me give you again an example going back to the pens. So if you look at the list of restricted intermediaries or restricted goods based on the NAFTA rules of origin on the pens, some of them, if you, are, if you just look at the list, seem to be actual inputs in the production of the pens, core yarn or cotton sewing thread, but others like linoleum floor coverings, which are part of the list, clearly don't seem like inputs in the production of the pens. So what we did was to rule out rules that are not, verti you know, they're not applied to vertically related goods and are basically not input in the production of the final good by using input output tables. So one of the big, actually, uh, one of the things that people are asking us now is to provide the input output tables because we use the BAA, US input output tables, which are extremely dis dis disaggregated. There's more than 500 sectors. So, and, and we converted in HS to be able to say, well, is this rule of origin really applying to a good that is, there is an input in the production of the final good? So should this rule be really meaningful or should we, because we wouldn't expect any effect if you're saying, okay, there's a rule of origin uh, uh, on pens that restrict linoleum, we wouldn't expect any effect on linoleum because this is clearly not uh, an input. So what we did also and, uh, is to, to basically keep track of that. There's not that many rules, but in some, for the broadly defined rules, those are the chapter, there's actually very often rules that are irrelevant and you wanna be able to throw them away, which we do. Uh, okay, these descriptives are very, very small. This is just to say, if you look at the data, and this is just descriptive statistics at the industry, very broad sector aggregation, what you see is a lot of variation. You're not seeing it, but in chemicals, for example, there is like, if you look at the first treatment, just the count of how many rules, on average, intermediate goods in chemicals have 559 rules. But, and, and, but however, when you look at the second treatment, RO2, most of the rules, no, some of the rules are irrelevant. You go from 550 something to 449. And then if you go to the last column, when you look at those that are no, they're strict, there's only two. So there's a big drop in chemicals because there's a lot of value added rules. In other sectors, say chemicals, no, te textiles, which is in apparel, which is the other one I outlined, is an interesting sector because there you see a lot of rules, 280 on average, apply to intermediates. When you go to the, most of them are relevant. There's very few you drop when you drop those that have uh, zero preference margin and there's no value added rule. So what you see is that there is variation and this is only at the sectoral level. There's much more variation even within sector. But there's variation in both how many rules there are and on what type. Are they relevant and strict? And this is all the variation we're gonna exploit in our data. There's also variation in how much you gain. This is just to tell you, you know, if you, for example, in textile, the preference margin on average is 10.21, while in other sectors, there's a smaller difference between the MFN and the preferential tariff rate. So again, that is variation we are gonna exploit in our analysis. Right, how much time, somebody should give me warnings, I should stick to 45. And I wanna go to the end to the policy implications. So what I'm going to do next is to just give you a sense for the key results I'll show you a few tables, but uh, I'll try to emphasize like the bottom line, and then I want to spend the, the last, uh, say, 10 minutes discussing the implication for uh, WTO, like for multilateral trade rules, and maybe if there is some time dis discussing Brexit, implications for Brexit. I'm now in London, so a lot of I've been interacting, as I was saying at lunch 
with people from the Trade and FDI Committee and the Cabinet to actually, who are now all of a sudden interested in rules of origin in these FDA negotiations. But if there is time, otherwise I'll stick to the trade policy implications. Right, so what are the, let me say first of all, what is this triple difference approach that we use? So basically in the, the way we, we try to identify the trade diverting effect of NAFTA rules of origin is as follows. We look at Mexico, because you know, for US and Canada, you could think there's endogeneity concerns that are much more serious because these are the guys, in particular the US, that really drafted the rules uh, when the Canada-US free trade agreement was you know, negotiated in the 80s. So we look at Mexico, and we look at Mexican inputs before and after the NAFTA. So as a, in the benchmark analysis, as a pre-NAFTA year, we use 91 and 2003 as a post. Uh, we do different uh, start and end year, nothing changes. We then look at a uh, triple difference means that you are exploiting both variation over time, pre and post NAFTA, variation across products. Some products got rules of origin applied to them, some not. Some got a lot of rules, some others fewer, and also the type of rules. And then as well as cross-country variation. So we are also exploiting the fact that some countries, third countries, non-members, got treated while uh, the US and Canada didn't get treated, didn't get subject to rules of origin. So all of this is part of your, uh, what you're exploiting in this triple difference regression. Let me skip this equation, but this is just to say that the key advantage compared to the more standard uh, diff and diff methodology is you can deal with omitted variable concern and sectoral trends. So what you're anyway trying to explain, this is your dependent variable in this regression, is how uh, Mexican imports, the growth rate of Mexican imports from non-member countries, or a particular good HSC's good J, change between 91 and 2003 compared to the change of the same good in the same period from the US and uh, Canada. So you're saying to what extent, what explains the relative change in Mexican imports from third countries compared to NAFTA partners uh, using information about, as I said, time variation, you're looking pre and post NAFTA, variation in, uh, in treatment, in rules of origin. So this is gonna be the key variable of interest is this rule of origin treatment, the various types. And you're controlling always for this preferential tariff. Of course, one of the channels I said at the beginning through which uh, NAFTA and free trade agreements more generally can distort trade in intermediates and could affect this change in relative imports of intermediates from, NAF, from third versus uh, FTA partners could be simply tariff, tariff cuts, the preferential tariff cuts. So we are always controlling for that, but our key regressor of interest is rules of origin, this rules of origin treatment. So what do we find? We first just have a couple of tables. Just, you know, again, don't focus so much on the number, but what you see is whether you use all rules or you restrict the analysis as we do here to uh, only those that apply to vertically linked goods, you see that there is a negative coefficient on RO1, RO2, and RO3. So this is all rules. This is only rules that are relevant, positive preference margin. These are rules that are relevant and strict. You see that they're always significant and they, the size of the, of the coefficient increases in size. So you see it with all rules. You see it when excluding rules that are not you know, applying to vertically related good using information from input tuple tables. So do you see this negative effect of rules of origin on imports of intermediate goods from third countries? So if you have a good J, say the engine, you're trying to explain how Mexican imports of say engine or watch parts change as a result of the introduction of NAFTA rules of origin, controlling for the change in tariffs and controlling for other things, many other things that are accounted for by this methodology. And you're finding that uh, a negative and significant coefficient, and a particularly negative and significant coefficient for the strict and relevant rules. You cannot actually compare in this table the different types of rules because these treatment variables are not self, uh, no, they're not excluded, one contains the other. So what we also do is to say, okay, let's now define uh, mutually exclusive variables. So we have now what we call RO plus E, but which is basically just focusing on rules that are irrelevant because they have zero preference margin. They should have no effect. You can put it together with what we call RO flexible, which is basically the relevant rules, meaning there's something to gain. There's a positive preference margin, 
but they are flexible. There's a value-added alternative. And rules of origin that are relevant and strict, like RRO3. And what you see when you do that is that you use like this placebo test works, rules that don't matter because there's nothing to gain, have no trade diverting effect. Rules that are, you know, there's something to gain, but they are very flexible, have no trade, significant trade diverting effect. But when the rules are both relevant and strict, then you have a very sizable and very significant negative you know, coefficient, which is basically saying, you know, when producers had no choice but complying with these tariff shift rules, they dropped, basically stopped importing the engine from Germany, the, the cotton yarn from uh, Vietnam, etc. So there was really a significant drop of uh, imports of intermediate goods from third countries as a result of these uh, rules of origin on the final goods. In terms of quantification, basically, what you see is that what I told you before, this is with all rules, this is with vertically related, you know, rules applying to vertically related goods. It, it goes up a bit, as you would expect, but basically you see that uh, the bottom line is that the, the introduction of NAFTA rules of origin decreased the growth rate of Mexican imports from third countries uh, relative to NAFTA partners by around 50 log points, which actually represent around 45% of the actual change in intermediate goods, which is equivalent to say that had there not been rules of origin, the imports of these treated goods would have been 45% larger. We also show much more, like you can show that the effect is larger for when the preference margin is larger. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. And we have a lot of robustness check. We have an appendix which is almost as long as the paper, uh, an online appendix of like 30 pages where we do a lot of robustness. What you see the result don't change if you use a different start and end year if you use different set of countries, like uh, in the set of third countries, non-NAFTA partners in our benchmark regression that I showed you, we had all countries that didn't have an FTA with Mexico. But then there are countries like with Chile or others, even the European countries that in 2003 did have an FTA with Mexico with its own FTA. So we include them in some robustness checks. Uh, we have different ways to deal with zeros or not. Like we have lots of robustness checks both on the methodology, the sample, et cetera, and the results are very robust. Uh, so what we have done is basically using a lawyer to basically codify the rules of origin embedded in the NAFTA agreement, which is the biggest FTA, and has some particular legal feature that make it easy once you have a lawyer on board to trace these input output linkages in the rules. We have basically constructed this data set that allows you to map the input up or linkages uh, that are embedded in the agreement. And then what we have done is to show uh, that these rules can really have, as we expected from the theory, but really do have a, a significant and sizable impact in terms of reducing, uh, you know, deterring trading of intermediate goods from non-member countries. Uh, and I think it's, it is important because when you think about intermediate goods, when, you know, this is a study from the OECD, but there are many studies showing that input tariffs are actually very low compared to tariffs on final goods. Usually, so people may think, okay, but then there's not much protection. You know, global value chains are free. You know, inputs, look at MFN tariffs on, on, on intermediates are very, very low. That is true. However, you basically, what our study shows is that because there are f rules of origin on final goods that impose implicitly sourcing restriction on the inputs, the, there is an implicit covered uh, tariff on these inputs. Because if you, again, going back to the car engine, if you have a big difference between, say, you get zero rather than 20% when exporting your car to the FTA partners, if you comply, then even if the engine is, a, you know, you could import the engine from Germany at zero, you don't want to do it. You stop importing it from Germany because you want to get the origin so that you can get zero rather than 20% on the final good. So you're basically transferring protection from the output to the input. Um, so I promise I will stop. I will end with the implication for multilateral trade rules. And here there is Petros. I'm happy I added the, your, a quote. Where are you, Petros? Where is Petros? He's gone. <laughs> So Petros sent me a couple of uh, days ago a paper he has written with Edwin Verma. So these are two economists where they tried to actually, he didn't cite us, so he, I was a bit mad, but he, he wasn't actually aware. Sometimes lawyers and economists should talk more. But you know, his paper is challenging the view. Actually, it's called, I have it here, you should read, The Case of Dropping Preferential Rules of Origin. So 
They are basically saying that these rules are distortive, but they're also challenging the legal, you know, the legality of them. And, and, and I think it's a very interesting paper. I recommend it. When you look at the law, in fact, it's interesting that the GATT didn't have anything explicit on rules of origin. And that's not surprising, because when the GATT was first written, nobody cared about global value chains or sourcing or, or the potential distortion. It was, you know, I think it, it was hard at the time to, to talk about where a good comes from, but it was much easier than today, where now, you know, where your iPhone is coming from, it's, it's much more complex to define the origin. Anyway, what the GATT does say about preferential, well, about free trade agreements is, of course, contained in Article 24. And the key principle is that free trade agreements shouldn't be uh, giving rise to, you know, they, they shouldn't be the regulation of commerce in the FTA shall not be higher or more restrictive than the corresponding duties and regulation. In the, so what you should have is no trade diversion. You know, what, what our study clearly shows is that not in terms of the tariffs, maybe, if you look at the MFN tariffs of the members, they may not increase when you, when you negotiate an FTA. But in terms of the rules of origin that are contained in the FTA, clearly uh, FTA can violate uh, rules can violate Article 24 in the sense of increasing the, le the extent of protection that third countries face, in particular, you know, in when they are trying to export intermediate goods. And that's in a way why you could say one of the reasons why value chains tend to be regional, going back to Baldwin, you know, factory North America, factory Europe, where uh, you know rules of origin are part of it. Uh, Another uh, implication is that if you want to draft rules of origin, and if the goal of, of the rules of origin, there can be various political economy and other roles, but if the goal is not distorting trade, you want the rules to be flexible. You want the rules to be written in, as value-added rules rather than very rigid tariff classification shift rules, because you will have more efficient sourcing decisions than if you uh, write them in the way most of the NAFTA rules are actually written. Um, and now I'm going to skip the, the Brexit, unless you're very interested. We can go to, back to it uh, later. So with my, I'm thinking of working, I started to work actually with Lorenzo Caliendo and, and also Manu on a project that sort of, so here so far we have just shown, you know, constructed the data and shown a very clear evidence that of trade diversion. But they, there are many questions you can ask, in particular, what, how does it matter? If, you, if you're thinking about how distorting sourcing decision of firms can affect their, their productivity, aggregate productivity and welfare, you need a model a bit like Lorenzo and, and um, Parro had in Ristad, or a model like uh, Paul Antras et al. Evan AR to, to understand the implication of distorting sourcing decision for productivity and welfare. So, that's one of the next questions. Another interesting question, I think, would be if one had detailed data on FDI to look at whether rules of origin led to uh, so-called, uh, you know, rules of origin jumping FDI. You would expect that if you are the Japanese or German producer of particularly intermediate, and, and you are, you know, you are affected by these rules, then you would want to, you know, relocate and set up subsidiaries in within NAFTA in order to be able to not to, you know, to suffer from these restrictions. So you would expect, but you know, for that, you, I'm sure there is some evidence, but you would need not aggregate FDI data, but very detailed data. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm very happy to, to take questions on anything I've said and more. Thank you very much, Paula.